Now, are you as excited for this as I am? In fact, the whole team are, because we can't wait. We're learning so much. Now, last week, it was the first time that we had our resident vet on the show, Chris Tomlinson, and we're going to get stuck in with it today, and you've been sending through your questions, so I think what we'll do, we'll go through a few of them first of all, and then we will play a song, and we'll come back to Chris, and we will get into the heart of the feature, as they call it. So, good morning, Chris. Good morning, Gareth. How are you? I'm very, very well. Uh, glad to see that you're a man who isn't scared to wear salmon pink. Love it. When we worked in Tanzania, we had some some of the Tanzanians would wear even more bright colours than this, Gareth. <laughs> so, trouser suits as well. <laughs> what we're going to be talking about is ticks, mites, lice and fleas, which uh, sounds like it's a really bad band from the 1980s. But no, uh, we are going to be talking about them, the difference in what you do, how you avoid your animal from getting them. But before that, we've got some questions and thank you for sending these through. So the first one is from Emma and it says, I've got two young children and I'm looking at getting getting a dog which dog would chris advise that we get because we want something which we know will be safe around our young children over to you doc well um temperament is everything and that does vary i would say um a steady dog like a labrador is generally very gentle and kind but I have known other small dogs. We have got uh, what are known as a Pouchon, which is a poodle cross with a Bichon Frise. And though they're a bit yappy, they're again very gentle. My wife suggested getting those when we had two young children. The, the thing about it is you should never trust a dog with young children, not entirely. You never know. So uh, generally a dog like a Labrador is very steady and particularly want to see what the parents are like. Um, also with young children, you have to be aware, you know, how much time you can give to the dog because it will need exercise and attention as well. But generally, a la you know, something like a Labrador, you see the, the, the mum and dad. The only trouble is if it's a, they would live in a smaller house, then that can take up a lot of room. And then maybe looking like a smaller dog. Another type I, I like, is the Cavalier King Charles. It's a very gentle little dog, but it does have health issues, possibly with its heart and with the other conditions. So again, the key thing is that you should never trust a dog, no matter what breed it is, with a child. Yeah, I would say so, because you just don't know what a child can do. You know, generally, the, 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 if a dog is brought up with a child, normally they understand them and cope with them but the problem can be and I've, I've known my son has this where the dog was very happy uh when with his own children but when other children came into the house it, it guarded them so you you really want to do a bit of research talk to other people who keep that breed and you know mums who who keep dogs that's how my wife came across this Pouchon breed and, and just see what seems to fit for your lifestyle. Because you may have some a mum who loves running, you know, and she may want a dog that she can go running with, you know, to keep her fit and keep the dog fit. While others may feel that they haven't got the time to fit to that and want a smaller dog who doesn't need the same level of exercise. But the great thing about a dog, you know, Gareth, is that um, they, they clear up under the high chair, so you don't have to get the hoover out afterwards. Look, Chris, uh, please don't start this because my family are listening right now and I've got a six-year-old and I've got a four-year-old and they're at the age now where they're starting to ask for pets. But typically, it's not the kind of pets. So they wouldn't just have friends who have got little hamsters and cats. No, some of their friends have got horses. And I've started hearing the thing of, Daddy, well, can we have a horse? And I'm thinking there is not any possibility that you'll be having a horse even a little dog but my answer to this and maybe you can correct me or you can confirm that this is right because both me and my wife work full time so our attitude is that we don't want to get a dog yet because it wouldn't be fair on the dog just to leave it in the house on its own for well full days is that right or are there some dogs that can be left in the house and they'll be all right 
it is very tricky, particularly puppies. I wouldn't want them left on their own. An older dog can cope with it. But, you know, it's they are social animals. They, they're part of a pack. And really, I would say four hours would be the l longest time I would prefer to leave a dog, just in case you get caught out. But, you know, they, if you wanted a dog that didn't need too much maintenance, ironically, the greyhounds, if you get a rescue greyhound, they used to be walked out in the morning and then they can lie down all day. We tend to think they're really active dogs, but they're, they're not. They, they have their walk in the morning and they're happy to just lie there snoozing the rest of the day. Now, one of the dogs I have seen, so I shared this last week, I'm not really an animal person, which seems strange to have a professional vet on the show, but um, I want to ask you, so when I went to Crufts, because my wife is a big, big fan of dogs, uh, hence why she married one. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, one of the dogs I saw, and I thought, actually, that, that looks fairly practical. I think it was a French greyhound. It was a small little thing, and it didn't shed any fur. You're looking confused. Have I just made that breed up, Chris? Is there some well, sort of French... You might be thinking of an Italian greyhound, which is about that... this big. That's the one. Dinky, and they are really sweet dogs, yeah. They generally have a very good nature, a bit timid, if anything. And is that something that wouldn't sort of leave fur everywhere? It wouldn't be barking all the time? And I can just basically take it around the block once a day and it'll sit there in front of the fire. <laughs> not a problem. Yeah, I, I, on the whole, but getting them will be difficult. They're not very common, see, Gareth. But, I mean, the other thing, you could always bring your, your, the dog to work with you. I'm sure it would liven up the studio. <laughs> I remember when I was young, that Tony Blackburn had two Labradors when he started. Whether they were real Labradors or they just barked on a, uh, on a thing you put on, I'm not certain. <laughs> right, we're going to take a break. Um, if you have got any questions for Chris, then send them through. The WhatsApp number that you need is the usual one. And it is, let me find it, 0161 511 9555. That's 0161 511 9555. If you've got any questions for Chris. But what we're going to do next is to delve into the heart of the feature. We're talking about ticks, my, not mice, ticks, mites, lice and fleas. Do you think the Italian greyhound may be coming to our house? I'll give it, what, 20 years or so. Um, I've said to the kids that when I'm in a retirement home and I've said that when you have the house, you can have a dog. How does that sound, Chris? That's a fair deal, isn't it, really? Well, I think you're a hard man, Gareth. You're a hard man. <laughs> this is the thing. So I want to ask you, because a few people have been asking the question, are you born an animal person or can you sort of adjust to it? So if I spent loads of time around dogs, would I become a dog person or is it just either you are one or you're not one? No, I've known people who said, oh, I never thought I'd enjoy a dog. I thought it was a cat person. And then the, the husband or wife talked them into having it. And actually, they become very bonded to the, to the dog or the cat, really. And I, I think, you know, the thing about animals, they're really good for our mental health, whether it's having a cat in your lap and you're stroking it or a dog, you take it for a walk. And it's just so happy to see you first thing in the morning or when you come home from work. And... Yeah, it just means you, you've got something that really loves you. And particularly in lockdown, it is a huge benefit to people who have pets to have that social environment they could mix with. This is one of the problems I've got, you see. It's not really the fact that having a dog, like, I would love to walk a dog. Do you know, because I like getting out. I love uh, when my wife says that we need milk and it's an excuse to walk up to the shop. I love that kind of thing. But my problem is that I've not been raised with dogs and I've always classed animals as sort of, and I hate saying this on the radio because I know people will be thinking, what's he saying? As sort of dirty things. So the fact that I'd have a cat on my lap and all the fur and everything, it, it makes me feel uneasy. Is that something I can work on? Is that something I can get over? Well, I, I'm not a psychologist, Gareth. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, uh, so I guess that animals, are, are they dirty creatures? Are they clean things? Will I be catching germs off them and spreading them around the house? 
No, I think actually an animals for, for children are really helpful. I think they're good for the mental health. They expose children to, um, you know, to, to what we call allergens, different sort of things that it, given in moderation actually helps their immune system rather than that then they don't react when they're exposed to different things really so yeah, there are occasionally you find a child who get a problem with with the dog hair or that sort of thing but most children do absolutely fine you're sort of selling it to me here chris uh, right so we're going to move on now too i never knew so this is why we love this feature because i never knew there was a difference i genuinely thought that it was the same thing just called different things so we're talking about ticks mites lice and fleas now i'll tell you that i i think actually that a tick is something that attaches to you because i've had one of these through walking through long grass i've had a tick on me uh my parents didn't take me to the vet at the time but i think that ticks are something that you sort of get attached to you and all the other ones maybe grow on the fur am i anywhere near right there chris well you 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 you're halfway there really gareth yeah the tick is a very interesting creature. It lives off the host, and then um, the, 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 the tick will then climb up a bit of grass and wait for somebody to come past. Could be a sheep, could be a deer, could be a rabbit, or could be like yourself. And then it will hop off and have a meal, blood meal. It will then, if it's a mature tick, it will then lay eggs, and they will wait and they will grow. They will hatch out in the spring and they'll climb up the top of the grass, but they're not the fully mature one. It goes through two stages. So they will then hatch, have a blood meal, hop off, and then they climb up again and have another meal and hop off. So it, it's a, it grows in stages. While, um, and you tend to see ticks from about April through till September, October, depending on the warmth. They're very related to the warmth. So when we were in Tanzania, they had ticks all through the year. But here in England, being a temperate climate, in the winter when it's cold, we tend not to see them. But they are, people hate them. They get really worried about ticks. Yeah. Are they the kind of thing that you just, when you see them on your animal, you sort of flick them off? Because if you don't, I imagine they'll start going under the skin. Where have I got that from? No, 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 you, 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 that's not right. They will bite in with their, their, their jaws to suck the blood, but they won't burrow under. They just, the head gets embedded. So what you need to do is to, you can get these funny, that looks like a, a little fork that you can put over it and twist the tick off. Um, and, and that will remove it and remove the head. So you spin it off. You get those in, in good pet shops, that sort of thing, or in vets. But um, nowadays we do have medicines you can treat your um, your dog on a regular basis or cat to stop the actual tick being able to to bite and stay on. And then we've got mites. What are mites all about? Who are they? Well, you have uh, mites, and they tend to burrow under the skin. And there's two you find: a Sarcoptes and a Demodex. And uh, one looks a bit like a, a caterpillar. And it, you see it particularly in young animals that haven't developed immune system. And the other gives, makes them really, really itchy. And those we tend to diagnose by taking what we call a skin scrape. We get a scalpel blade, scrape the skin, and then look under the microscope. And if you're lucky, you'll see them on there. And that's very exciting when you find them. Uh, they're becoming less common because of the modern uh, treatments we have for, for, for ectoparasites, as we call them. I like that phrase. <laughs> That's very exciting when you find those. The owners are there panicking. Chris is in his element going, you'll never guess what I've just found, and all his colleagues are around there with a magnifying glass. Oh, yeah. And then, <laughs> and then so actually, what once you've taken these things off, do you send them off to be studied? Do you sort of sit around with the other vets that you're training and you show them things of these mites and stuff? Yeah, I mean, we we all, you know, sometimes you're just busy and you just say that's the diagnosis treatment and off you go. And often the history helps you to know what you're looking for because if somebody's using a very good uh, flea and tick 
and mite treatment, you almost rule it out anyway. You would do a skin scrape just to make sure. But um, in other cases, it, particularly with students, it, it's good for them to see it and under, come in and look what the animal looks like. So the, we, one way of diagnosis is picture mirroring. So you see, I've seen that what a scabby dog looks like. It's got sarcoptic mange and you store that away in your head. So when you next see another dog that's scabby, you think this could be uh, a dog with sarcoptic mange. And then the other two, so lice and fleas. Yeah. Well, lice we tend to see in young dogs that haven't been very well looked after. And so, sadly, some people who breed puppies don't look after them as well as they should do, and they will, they will develop lice on them. And they live on the skin, and we by brushing the skin and then, or using a bit of um, sellotape, so I'll brush the skin onto a piece of paper, suddenly take it down and look under the microscope, you will see the, the, the lice there. And they're very simple to treat. And then fleas is, is the biggest one. You know, that's what we see the most of. And the thing about the flea story is that it's cats that tend to bring fleas into the house. And once they're in the house, the flea says, this is nice and warm and it's moist. I will make up, set up home there. And they will feed off anything they can, even yourself or your children, um, have a meal of blood, produce some eggs, and uh, you get this, this marvellous life cycle, a bit like a butterfly, but not quite so pretty. I like how when people ask and say, what animal would you love to be? I think you've just convinced me that I'd like to be a flea because it sounds like it would be the perfect thing of just down in some fur, keeping warm. And then there's loads of food everywhere and basically relaxing a lot. Um, so is it only do Well, it isn't only dogs because you just mentioned cats, but bigger animals like do you get fleas? Do you get ticks and mites in things like bears or things like I'm trying to think horses yeah you don't tend to get fleas in horses but you do get mites there and lice and you'll find with horses when they're rugged up for the winter so they put a rug and keep them outside that it is good conditions if a lice gets in there it will breed phenomenally under the rugs it's warm and moist um, and ticks when i was out in tanzania you found ticks on cattle ticks on horses and they carry Think about ticks, the most important thing is they carry diseases, like we can get Lyme's disease off um, ticks here in the UK with cattle. They carry a whole variety of diseases, um, which, which can be really fatal for cows. Now, I know because I've seen them advertised on TV that fleas can be treated with over-the-counter stuff, can't they? But the other ones, is it something that you need to go and see your vet about? Yeah, I would say... Um, You've got to be careful what you buy over the counter because some fleas are getting quite resistant to some of the things. And, and the other thing we've got to be mindful of looking after the environment is that we don't want indiscriminate use of flea treatments. And sadly, some pet shops aren't very uh, educated in what they're recommending. But the, the basic thing you'll get over the counter is a drug called Fipronil. It comes in all different kinds of names, a bit like cornflakes but it will treat ticks and it will treat um, fleas, lice less so and, and mites less so. It will have a slight suppressive effect, but actually uh, there are better things you can use. And just before you go, Chris, so there's loads of questions and we will compile these and we'll ask them on future weeks. But this here um, is one from Tracy. And Tracy says, could you please ask Chris what would be a suitable dog for my aunt? She can't walk much, but she would love a dog since her husband died and she doesn't want to be alone. She wants company. What do you reckon, Chris? Well, my dear old mum, she had a, a, a Pekingese when she, uh, she in her in her later life and that was a very good companion to her um didn't need a lot of exercise and sat around the only thing about Pekingese is they do can have breathing issues but she got a lovely lot of uh a lot of lot of support and encouragement from having Jacques he was known as 
Um, but yeah, small little dogs. The other thing, Chihuahuas are quite nice little dogs. They're a bit yappy, but they don't need a, a lot of exercise as well. They can run around the house and get a fair bit. So yeah, think small. Thank you very much, Chris. Well, if you've got any future questions for Chris, he's going to be with us every week on a Thursday, and we're so blessed to have him. I mean, I was just there thinking how many radio shows have got. I'm going to say this, Chris, one of the most experienced vets in the country, and also, in fact, I'll put it out there, the best vet in the country. There's no other radio station that has this. A gentleman like Chris giving up his time once a week to take your questions and to educate us on our animals, how to take better care of them, or which animals to actually get. So the number is, this is WhatsApp, by the way, 0161 511 955. 0161 Thanks very much, Chris, and we'll speak to you again next week. Okay, bye there, Gareth. Bye.